Okay, uh, our next speaker is a, a writer and activist and can build robots and bake pies and do yoga and all kinds of cool shit. So let's give it up for Kaylee Whalen. Hi, Skepticon. Thank you for bringing me here. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to address an audience like this. I've uh, been part of the atheist movement for several years. I worked with the American Humanist Association briefly and I'm an activist with the National LGBTQ Task Force. So uh, this is my first big conference and uh, I'm gonna give this a shot. So thanks for being a captive audience and uh, you know, hope I keep you entertained and don't make you cry too much because this is actually a rather deep uh, subject of the murders of transgender women, uh, particularly transgender women of color, uh, which is a campaign that I have helped launch and run through the National LGBTQ Task Force, where I am their digital strategies and social media manager. So Laverne Cox, probably a lot of people know about Orange is the New Black, perhaps saw her playing Sophia on the show. Um, Laverne came to my conference uh, last year. We have the Creating Change conference every year with about 4,000 people. And these are things she said while she was on stage, which really, uh, if you've heard the Time Magazine article about the transgender tipping point. For the first time, we have trans people in the media being represented like Laverne Cox and Janet Mock telling our stories how we want them told. And I wanna tell you a little bit about my story and help bring this conversation and this media spotlight to bring attention to issues beyond the LGBT issues like gay marriage that we hear about all the time and really talk about what's really hurting our community. But first about my story. Now, trans people, you generally, you know, the before and after picture. So I decided to give you my before transition. And there's my after transition. <laughs> so uh, on the left, you know, that's uh, Green Springs uh, right outside my high school. I was, went to Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. I was studying physics and robotics. And on the right is uh, while I was working at the American Humanist Association, I would stop by the Occupy DC camp and occasionally do some break dancing there. So there we go. Next one. So that's my high school. I've always been surrounded by weirdos. Uh, top left is my girlfriend. She's now a brain surgeon. Uh, bottom right is my friend Naomi, who at the time was presenting male. We transitioned uh, kind of in parallel courses and figured out we transitioned. And uh, she's a theoretical physicist uh, who works, uh, does research at particle accelerator labs. Um, that's me at Rice University. Actually, that is a pre-transition photo. Um, I was a militant atheist. Uh, I was really angry at the Campus Crusade for Christ. And I would, they would have signs up in the bathrooms there uh, with like God quotes on them. And I'd put like God is dead, Nietzsche and stuff on the bathrooms beneath it. Um, and I shaved my head, had a mohawk, looked really weird for someone in Texas. And I'm still pretty weird. Um, that's me dressed as David Bowie and my friends dressed as David Bowie, different eras. My friend Dean and Leia Menares uh, with the uh, Aladdin Sane makeup um, is the one who designed that logo that was on the first slide. So that is the artwork that she did. Um, so she's good at makeup and that kind of art. So, okay, so a little bit more about my story. Like I said, um, I'm an activist. I was originally gonna be an engineer. I actually took a sidetrack and uh, decided to study women's studies, English literature, and uh, did um, transferred from Rice uh, and went to Swarthmore College. So what happened at Swarthmore College while I was studying women's studies is I started interning at an organization called the Trans Health Information Project. Now, if anyone's seen Paris is Burning or is a pop or aware of the ball scene culture and the culture of voguing, um, this drop-in center, which was a HIV AIDS prevention drop-in center, had an entire floor where it was just people practicing for the ball. Um, and ball culture, voguing, 
is a big part of queer, trans, people of color culture. And it's a way to strut your stuff. You're usually part of a community that's a house, like House of Extravaganza or House of Revlon. And you compete at these competitions for different prizes and strut your stuff. And that was the first experience I had uh, being part of a community of trans people was hanging out with people in the ball scene in Philadelphia while volunteering for my internship at the Trans Health Information Project. And I am Latina. Um, I'm multiracial, white and Latina. My parents, uh, my mom is a uh, Puerto Rican and Guatemalan descent. Uh, but this was my first time to interact with uh, trans people of color beyond just kind of that liberal arts bubble. And while, you know, a lot of the people that I interacted with were really beautiful and had this really cool culture they were part of, most of them didn't have jobs, many of them were homeless, and a lot of them had to resort to this sex work uh, to survive, and many were also HIV positive. And one of these individuals who did sex work was named Erica Keels. Now, she was killed while I was volunteering there in a hit and run. She was one of the clients I had interacted with. And th this woman, uh, this person uh, named Roland Budden, he ran her over with his car. Uh, and he not only ran her over once, he then backed up, ran her over again, and then put the car back and forward and ran her over again. And there were other women out there on the street in addition to the uh, Trans Health Information Project volunteers who got his name and license plate and they asked the police to investigate and the Philadelphia Police Department said it was nothing and they refused to investigate. They said she was nothing, it was nothing. You're making a big deal out of nothing. And that was really an eye-opening moment. Not only did they harass the women, they then asked them their birth names and refused to file a report and were demanding that these women tell them their male birth names. So that was a big awakening for me, was this murder. Um, the same year, also, the Philadelphia Fire uh, and Rescue, they, there was a woman who was killed, uh, what, was badly burned, nearly killed in a fire in her car. And the police, or sorry, the emergency response team to deal with her burns were t ripping off her clothing and figured out she was trans and left her there to die. So those things both happened the same year while I was volunteering in Philly. So this is the situation. Uh, trans people, especially trans women of color, are murdered uh, constantly. Every 32 hours, we have a murder uh, of a trans woman. We've had 11 in the US this year. This graph, this chart uh, is 10, because this is only up to September 30th. Uh, we've actually had more, depending on what violence tracker you use. Some say 260 murders, some say more. Um, a lot are in uh, heavily Catholic um, Latin America. Um, and Brazil is a leader in murders of trans women. Um, but uh, it is an epidemic, and it is a problem in the US. And this is just murders. This is not suicides. We don't track hate crimes here. It's a problem. Um, we have the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Act. Um, you know, we have a lot of hate-motivated bias against different communities in the US. but. The anti-gay violence is the most deadly, and trans women are 32 times more likely to be murdered in a hate crime than a gay man. Now, we don't have the numbers, and actually the numbers are much higher, uh, but we do know that 72% of all LGBT people murdered in a hate crime uh, are generally trans women, and 90% are trans women of color. Uh, that's from 2013. So when we talk about violence against gay people, when we talk about violence against LGBT people, uh, when we talk about hate-motivated hate motivated violence in general, uh, trans women of color, uh, primarily black and Latina, are the number one targets of hate violence in the US. Um, it's not something many people talk about. So 
mental health. I'm just going to touch on this real quick. I could do an entirely different lecture on mental health. Uh, but really the facts are we're talking about murders, but there are so many trans women and trans women of color who m take their own life each year. 41% of trans people, according to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, which was a survey that went out to thousands and thousands of people in 2011, 41% of transgender people have attempted suicide. We have no idea how many people actually complete a suicide attempt, but it's pretty dire. And many of these people, again, you know, they're without family support, they're on the streets, they're homeless, they don't have health care. 25% have never accessed mental health care if you're dealing with depression and trauma coming out. How are you going to do that if you don't have a mental health care provider? 22% um, of trans people have been refused medical care. This doesn't just mean they've been refused trans surgery. This means that they go into an emergency room for a broken leg and they find out that the person is transgender and the health care insurance policy says that they do not cover transgender related care. Well, this has actually happened in emergency rooms that they're saying, oh, we can't do anything because your insurance denies uh, trans care. It's getting better nationwide. But uh, most uh, health care policies uh, up until like a year ago uh, refused any kind of care for trans people that was transition related, but often it was interpreted to be any kind of care for a trans person. Um, some of the other things, um, surgery is medically proven that it helps. The medical science is pretty uh, clear. Uh, there is a consensus that what is now called gender dysphoria is a treatable condition. It's treatable by um, things like hormones and surgery if someone chooses, uh, counseling, having someone become comfortable in their own skin. That's how you deal with it. It's not an illness. Um, it's a treatable condition, and the medical community and the scientific community are 100% in consensus on that at this point. So anyone who tells you that trans people are mentally ill, it's a lie. I mean, everyone here needs to understand science and help other people understand science. And the science, the facts are in. It's a treatable con condition. It's not a mental illness. It does not make you sick. Okay, back to hate crimes. Ohio right now is the epicenter of hate crimes. Uh, we don't really know why, but um, we've seen four deadly incidents of violence there in the last year out of the 11 murders in the last year in the US. And then in addition to that, I kind of photoshopped in Candace Milligan, um, who was not killed, but was taken to the hospital with four critical injuries. Um, Ohio right now is trying to pass statewide non-discrimination legislation and my work at the task force is trying to do that. Here's some of the victims in Ohio. Candace Milligan on the far right was lucky. She survived, um, but was nearly killed. Uh, Tiffany Edwards was found dumped in the street by a sanitation worker. Um, Brittany Sturgis was shot in the head and killed instantly. And Betty Skinner, um, well, she was in an assisted care facility, had cerebral palsy, was wheelchair bound, and was murdered likely by someone within the facility, uh, blunt force trauma to the head. And that was the same day, uh, within 24 hours of Brittany Sturgis. So there's the map again. Um, in Cleveland, you had two murders in the same day. And then nearby, you had CC Dove uh, murdered just a few months before. Okay, there's one more uh, person I wanted to talk about, which was Ania Parker, and I'll come back to her later uh, because I'll be talking about Los Angeles. But Ania Parker, the police were calling the incident a failed robbery. There is a video, uh, there's sur actually several surveillance footage videos, and they show four men hassling her, grabbing her, grabbing her purse, shoving her. She's trying to get away from the men. She breaks free from the men, still clutching her purse. She tries to walk across the street. A man follows her, shoots her at nearly point blank range. She stumbles to the curb on the other side of the street and they leave her. And then the police said it was a botched robbery attempt. 
is not a botched robbery if you don't actually take the purse. It's not a botched robbery if you're being hassled and harassed and you're visibly trans and you're left to die. Like, people not calling that a hate crime, I consider that a crime. And it caused a massive outcry and was, that is why we held a protest in East Hollywood. And I'll talk more about that protest. Um, so building a team, um, trans women of color are warriors. We're going to stand up and fight back to this violence. So I'm going to talk about how we did that. And this is a graphic that Monica Roberts of the Trans Grio blog put on her blog when she was, we were launching this campaign. Ohio, the task force went and organized the Trans Leadership Academy in Ohio. Um, it looks like a lot of men, uh, partially because some of the trans women who were in the camp or who were in the academy, which was a six-day academy, didn't want to be on camera, didn't want to be on film, cause of possible repercussions and hate violence. Um, Chernobyl on the bottom far left um, is, uh, is, is one of the only, uh, is actually the only uh, trans woman of color uh, from Ohio who chose to be pictured, and she's someone I've worked with quite a great deal. So the task force does these leadership exchanges and leadership academies where we're trying to bring up local uh, activists. Um, then I reached out to people across the country, two really influential names. You'll notice Monica Stevens is a Doctor Who fan. She has her TARDIS door there. Um, <laughs> so Monica Stevens um, from Baltimore, uh, where we saw three murders recently, uh, Candy Hall, uh, Mia Henderson, and Kelly Young. And then Bambi Salcedo, Los Angeles, who's an immigration activist uh, and trans Latina activist uh, who was close with Sereda Reyes, who was someone she did activism with, who was another of the women killed this year, in addition to Ania Parker in LA. So we reached out across the country and found these two people to help lead, you know, this campaign. There's Bambi with her group, uh, the Coalition uh, Trans Latina. I'm, I'm Latina, but my Spanish is terrible. Mi español es muy malo, malísimo. Um, but uh, Coalición Trans Latina. Um, and this is uh, Bambi at our conference again, Creating Change, where we gave her the uh, Susan J. Hyde Award for Longevity in the Movement. Um, and that's Susan Hyde on the far uh, right. Um, and then that's Sisters of the T, which is Monica Stevens' group in Baltimore. And that is a protest they did um, for when Candy Hall was murdered. So first thing we did is I launched a Twitter chat. Um, we weren't sure how people would react. Uh, we chose the hashtag. We put it out there. And we got 1.4 million people uh, paying attention to this, uh, with 685 people contributing in just an hour. Um, and my work, my coworkers were extremely hesitant and very, very scared about opening up our work to a Twitter chat where any question could happen. So I spent actually weeks uh, putting together four pages of talking points. And we had our Trans Civil Rights Project Director, Kyler Brodus, and we had our Deputy Executive Director, Darlene Nipper, and we had our Media and Public Relations Director, Jorge Amaro, and we had myself, and we had our Public Policy Fellow, Sandy James, all participate in this Twitter chat in one big room. And then we had Monica Roberts of Trans Griot and a lot of other people we placed um, to take part in this. And this was the launch of the Stop Trans Murders campaign. And it made us realize that this had a ton of traction and people were really wanted to be ex were excited about engaging in a campaign like this. So then we decided to brand, to brand the campaign. That's Leah Monara's again, not in Ziggy Stardust, actually Aladdin Sane makeup. You get your David Bowie albums right. <laughs> They're different. Aladdin Sane's the, the, the lightning bolt, Ziggy Stardust, the gold emblem on the head. Anyways, so <laughs> I could go back to that slide. Um, so, uh, so that's Leo. She's a friend of mine. Uh, she's, uh, you know, Latina uh, uh, from a Mexican immigrant family who grew up um, 
near DC and is a DC based artist who does murals uh, in the DC area. And uh, she, uh, like Bambi, like Monica, you know, is someone who knows what it's like to have to resort to sex work to survive. She's someone who knows what it's like to be unemployed because you're trans. Uh, she's someone who knows what it's like to be harassed on the street for being a trans woman of color. Uh, myself, I've been harassed, but probably much less so because I look and appear white. Um, I, I uh, have a passing privilege a lot of the time um, that other trans women uh, do not or that other uh, Latina individuals do not. Um, and that's one reason that I'm an activist um, and have that opportunity is because I've been granted a lot of privilege, liberal arts educated, um, someone who uh, you know, had the, the money and the, the ability to do this work because uh, a lot of activism is unpaid. Um, that's the poster we made for the campaign. Um, we had an artist from uh, the Bay Area named Micah Bazant design the poster. And uh, we went through about 10 revisions because Bambi wanted to look less glamorous and more angry. And Monica didn't want to look angry, but wanted to look like stern. And we had to like get their faces right and get the pose right. And like they kept, we kept being like, we'd adjust the image for Bambi. And then Monica wanted to adjust it. And then Bambi wanted to adjust it. And then Monica wanted to adjust it. And then, and then Kyler, our trans civil rights project director, wanted it adjusted. So we had like, Literally, literally, not like figuratively, literally, literally, uh, like 30 versions of this. Um, so anyways, but the poster actually, I'll just, you know, do a little plug. If you tweet at me with a stop trans murders tag, I actually have posters here, which I'd be very happy if people wanted to uh, hand out or you know, hang up at your school and kind of promote this work. So um, these posters we've brought to rallies across the country, and I've been sending them to all the places where we've seen murders and where we have activists um, you know, holding these rallies, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so we had a film screening in DC, we had a law school event in DC, and we had a day of action um, all within the last few weeks, which is why I was making this speech at the last minute, because we had events this week on November 18th and 20th where we had these posters at. Um, I was on WPFW speaking about that. That's my deputy executive director, Charlie Nipper on the far right. And that's the original artwork that Leah made that the logo was based off of. Um, we had uh, Kyler Brodus, our Trans Civil Rights Project Director, speak at a law symposium at American University. And that was one of our first events for Stop Trans Murders, October 30th. Um, then we had a film screening in DC with Bambi Salcedo, who flew in from LA. And it was sponsored by a bunch of groups, um, including the Latino LG GLBT History Project. And I got to be in a lot of photos. And it was actually a pretty cool experience for me where uh, people like Alexa Rodriguez and Bambi Salcedo um, were super excited to grab me and pull me into every single photo shoot. And that is not something I often experience because not many people like really, like I've often not felt very much part of the Latino uh, community. But this, was, this campaign has really helped me connect a lot more uh, with other uh, Latinos and has been a really cool experience. And you'll see, um, you know, there's our poster in uh, one of those food photo shoots. And you can't see too well, but the, the top left person is Diego Sanchez, who is an incredibly influential person in the transgender movement. He was, uh, worked uh, in the office of Barney Frank. Um, and he it now is a uh, director at uh, P flag, uh, which is a huge LGBT organization, you, formerly called Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. They do transgender work. They now just call themselves P flag National. Um, but yeah. Okay, so in the middle of this campaign, we actually saw two murders happen um, as we were launching it. Uh, one was Ashley Sherman. The other was Gizzy Fowler. Um, Gizzy Fowler was murdered in Memphis. She was the second person murdered in Memphis this year. And um, I'll talk about why Memphis, Tennessee is really important. 
Um, but this graphic, when we put it together, uh, we really didn't know uh, what kind of traction or how people would react. And I was very hesitant to make the campaign about branding faces of dead people. I wanted to be sensitive about that. The thing is, we started doing these graphics. We did one for Ashley Sherman, and we did one for Gizzy Fowler. And this actually had more shares on social media than anything uh, the National LGBTQ Task Force had done since July. And people who saw this graphic came to the events and said clicking on this graphic, going to stoptransmurders.org, was what got them involved. Uh, so it made us feel really proud that we did these, you know, made this visually compelling, shareable social media stuff, and it got people physically to come to rallies, which a lot of people, it's difficult to make the bridge between social media and in-person activism. And one other thing I'll say about this, um, about this graphic is that um, I said it was the most shared graphic since July. Well, it's a little telling. The most shared graphic in July was when Virginia got same-sex marriage. So we're actually shifting a bit, where now we're seeing that marriage is kind of winning or has won, um, where we're trying to grab people's attention to a new thing. And it's kind of amazing. We haven't quite gotten past the reach of marriage, but it's pretty cool to see people engaging in stuff other than, yay, we want marriage, yay, marriage. I mean, I'm like not completely against marriage, just kind of a little bit as a feminist. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of a little bit just, you know, like poly, kinky, weirdo, marriage is never really, it's in the equation. Um, here, uh, so the day of action, um, we held uh, November 18th. That was with our allies across the country. Um, and the hashtag for the day of action, Trans Lives Matter, that morning, Upworthy called it the hashtag of the day, which is pretty cool. Um, people have mixed feelings about Upworthy, but when Upworthy calls something the hashtag of the day, a lot of people pay attention to it. Um, and we got tons of engagement. Trans Lives Matter reached 19 million people. Um, and the day of action, uh, with events across the country, um, including a die-in uh, by Bambi Salcedo and uh, uh, Latina activists in LA, which blocked the intersection right near where Ania Parker was murdered, shut down traffic during rush hour, uh, got a lot of attention. And then also I was at the rally in DC, um, and you can't see it that well, but the person wearing the shirt that says Orlando, is, um, ha has a poster uh, that says Victoria uh, Arellano. Uh, um, and Victoria was someone who was killed while in custody of immigration uh, and customs uh, ICE. Uh, she was in ICE custody and she contracted HIV. Um, there's no protection from sexual assault. And she started uh, in developing full blown AIDS. And the only medication they gave her were antibiotics. And she was dying, being refused medical care. Uh, she was, um, there were massive prison protests. And she died uh, hemorrhaging from blood uh, while being refused medical care in uh, immigration's uh, hands. And sadly, we see this all the time. Some of the women who are the most impacted by violence are immigrants. There are 267,000 LGBTQ immigrants uh, in the US right now who are undocumented, many who are fleeing countries where uh, there are laws uh, that criminalize uh, LGBTQ people, or perhaps people fleeing Brazil where another trans person is killed um, you know, every other day. So, Immigration is a huge, huge part of this. So I just have to put up a few more uh, quotes to talk about why this is a religious issue, why this is a skeptic issue, why this is an atheist issue, and why you know this really is not just something that is a grassroots campaign, but that we have to take all the way to our legislators. Um, because we have people like the former head of the 
South Carolina Republican Party who say things like, there are people who respect transgender rights and there are people who think you should all be put in a camp. That's me. And that's Todd Kincannon on his Twitter writing to a transgender uh, person uh, reporter who had reached out to him. Um, and then there's people like Richard Floyd, uh, Tennessee State Representative, who's Southern Baptist, who uh, was introduced or was a co-sponsor of HB 2279, um, which was, did not, he did not give it a name, so we gave it a name, and we called it the Tennessee Bathroom Harassment Act. Um, and bathrooms are a serious issue. It's, it's funny. Um, you know, we kind of have to jam culture and say, yeah, it's the Bathroom Harassment Act. Because uh, really, this act was about finding people and policing people which bathroom they were allowed to use. And uh, he said um, about why he supported this act that if I see a trans person trying to go into the dressing room with my wife and my daughter, I just try to stop a, stomp a mud hole in, he actually said him, because he was talking about a man dressed as a woman, so he purposely misgendered that person and said him. Uh, but you know, he said, I try to stop a, stomp a mud hole in him and stomp him dry. Don't ask me to adjust to their perverted way of thinking and put my family at risk. And this is simply for someone trying to go to the bathroom that is appropriate for their gender. And unfortunately, bathrooms are the number one, are one of the biggest sources of violence for trans people, um, which is why in Cleveland, uh, there is a huge, huge fight right now on the ground that the National LGBTQ Task Force is part of. And it's about amending their Civil Rights Act right now to be fully tr protecting transgender people. So what you see on the left is you have someone uh, from our staff, Justin Lemley, talking to voters on election day, having them sign pledge cards to speak with their legislators about supporting the public accommodations amendment, which would get rid of the rule right now that says that businesses have the right to tell a trans person what bathroom to use. Um, we've seen countless incidents of trans people being uh, experiencing violence in bathrooms, and the re re religious right talking point is that it's men in dresses who are going to go in and uh, assault um, their wives and daughters, and actually it's the trans people who are facing violence uh, in the bathrooms, uh, but they twist these arguments. So what you see on the right with the woman with the red hair, the people holding those yellow signs that say uh, thank you, are people who packed the courtroom when there was a hearing on this in Cleveland. And I was listening to and live tweeting the hearing, and you saw person after person go up there and say, I'm religious, and I respect and love my transgender brothers and sisters, but I don't want them walking into you know, the dressing room with my daughter and seeing her naked, and that's disgusting. And like again and again, you saw these people go up and say, it's against my religion. Um, and people saying that you know, this is perverted, Oh, I, you know, I accept trans people, but they can't use the same bathroom. Um, and then you also saw uh, w one of the council members was completely against it, and someone said, uh, and he was saying that, you know, oh, what do you mean trans people experience violence? Like, you know, it's, it's putting, they're a minority. You're putting a majority of people at risk, which is going to be our wives and daughters. And then someone stood up and said, council member, I have police reports here of three pe trans people who were murdered here recently. What do you say to that? So, okay, so here's a tough point, and I'm just gonna hammer this home a little bit. Our best allies in Cleveland, some of our best allies in Cleveland right now who are really making an impact are people of faith. Um, and that's partially to kind of turn that argument on, their he on its head that somehow this is against God's will. And we have ministers and we have faith leaders who are coming to this uh, Cleveland public accommodations hearing. And we have what we have, the interfaith prayer walk, which is this disciples gathering 
the different kind of church. Now, while this interfaith work actually is making a positive impact, it does worry me, and I don't like the idea that saying that we should make churches and congregations more welcoming is the number one way to solve this accepting trans people. Because honestly, the same, you know, you're kind of pushing the bar a little bit, you know, to make them more accepting, but these are the same places, like I was raised in the Catholic Church, that teach people shame about their bodies, that teach people these, these gender roles that are, you know, not in line with feminist values. And I, you know, like, it's, it's great um, working with faith leaders and the other trans woman on staff, the only other trans woman on staff of the task force is a person of faith. Um, she's in her 70s. Uh, her name's Barbara Sadden. She's been doing this activism a long time. She's our assistant faith work director. And she has also run the Minneapolis Transgender Day of Remembrance for the last 15 years, which is the ceremony every year where we list our dead. Um, and it's a public ceremony where every single trans person who was, died that year, uh, we commemorate. Um, and she's led that ceremony in Minneapolis for the last 15 years, but it is held across the country. There was uh, one in DC that I missed because uh, I flew out to Skepticon. It's held on the November 20th. Um, but if you look on our website, uh, Barbara Sadden, which I helped her with, wrote a blog post about the transgender the history of the Transgender Day of Remembrance called uh, We Are Beautiful, We Are Whole. And that's where that quote, um, the how could anyone ever tell you you are anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you that you are less than whole? Because we see this time and time again where trans people are told that they're not beautiful or that they're not whole or that they're not human or that their lives don't matter. And that is what we're fighting against. So. This is generally my, this is my big message. Um, you know, religion is literally killing trans people. Um, so let's work together on this. And I also was at Women in Secularism recently. And if someone reminds me who said this, I would love to know. But there was a panel on intersectionality. And they were talking about the mission of atheist organizations and how this mission has to include feminism and how this mission has to include LGBTQ. And what would you say to someone who said that, oh, it's making your mission too broad if an atheist organization has to work on transgender issues? And that panelist said, if you consider intersectionality mission creep, you need a new mission. Um, so if, a yeah. Thank you. So that's, uh, you know, I don't know if we have time for questions, but it's, it's uh, something as an atheist, as an activist that, you know, I really want our communities to work together and understand um, why this is such an important and crucial issue. Um, so I don't know, do we have time for questions? Is there any Q&A time? Do we have a mic set up? Okay. Four minutes, so maybe like one question. <laughs> Seems to happen a lot at this conference. No pressure to whoever gets that mic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No pressure, right? Okay, so I'm going to be quick. I'm actually from Cleveland, Ohio, uh -huh. and um, I am a new atheist, been out for the last two and a half years, and um, <laughs> thank you. And one of the things that concerns me is the concern you brought up regarding how religion defines gender roles. And I think the fear that comes of transgender people comes from the reactionary fear of how gender roles are subverted. And I just want to, I wonder how we can work with children in particular with understanding the transgender community because with the religious right, they are the most scared of how the, trans, how the transgender community will impact their children's views on their sexuality and how can we work with children on educating them mm -hmm. on this issue? Well, I mean, that's an excellent question. And I think uh, 
what we've seen, actually, there's been some studies on uh, children raised by uh, transgender parents that children are so much more open and accepting and willing and able to understand uh, what transgender means. And people think that this is like above kids' heads. It's like, you know, when they were telling people that, you know, oh, we can't teach kids about gay marriage because homosexuality is something that, you know, little kids shouldn't have to understand. But really, actually, kids uh, have this ability to grasp um, transgender issues way better than, than society thinks they do. So, I mean, there's lots of great books. There's lots of great education stuff out there um, that's really beginning to um, help change the dialogue. Uh, California public schools are now requiring um, LGBT uh, and teaching LGBT issues in the classroom. And actually, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things that I uh, happened when I was at the American Humanist Association um, was I got a, I was opening letters from the Family Research Council to do like opposition research. Because <laughs> I was writing fundraising emails for AHA, so I wanted to read the Family Research Council fundraising emails to see what they were doing. And I got an email um, saying, uh, transgender clownfish are threatening our children. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I open up this letter and it talks about the threat posed to children in California public schools by teachers in elementary school classrooms trying to explain transgenderism and how it occurs in nature to young kids by talking about how clownfish actually change genders. And they're making this huge argument about how this is like gonna tear down gender roles in our society by teaching about clownfish. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I saved that. I put it on Twitter, it was like my favorite letter. So like there are steps being taken and I want like, I mean, this goes back to like teaching science in schools, you know, like kids have the capability to understand this, you know, it's not unnatural. There's nothing unnatural about being transgender and it happens in nature all the time. So we need to like have that science and have that understanding in kids um, and have, you know, only about what's the number like 9% of trans of, of Americans know a transgender person. So we need to do more. Our allies need to do more um, uh, to kind of reach out to and connect with actual transgender people. So I guess that helps, hopes, hopefully answers your question. So. It did, thank you. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs>